Well, let's talk about HBO right now. Um, as we think about kind of the history of television and this, what's been called the golden age, this renaissance of television, I'm curious where you trace it back. Some people say it's Oz, 97. Some people say it's Sopranos, a little bit later than that. When did that start for, in your mind? You know, it's funny. Everybody always assumes The Sopranos was the catalyst, Sex and the City was the catalyst, The Wire was the catalyst, all you know, superior shows. But I think the tipping point was actually back in the early 90s with The Larry Sanders Show. Because what, yeah. what, Gary, what Gary did, what Gary Shandling did, is he said to the world, you can do something with a truly original voice. You can differentiate yourself from everything else that is in the medium. And excellence and quality will define success, not necessarily numbers. And I think what Gary did was he opened the door to a lot of other auteurs who saw the attention that he garnered, who saw not only the acclaim he got in the, in the media, but the attention he got in the creative community. People were watching what he was doing on HBO and saying, wow, that, that, that's, you know, I can try something like that. And I think he opened the door to what really became the modern HBO. And then I guess the next question is, why did it take so long for us to get there? HBO existed, Showtime existed. Because in, in fairness, the model of television and the model of HBO are very different. The model of television is that they are selling CPMs. They are selling advertising. Um, that's the way they measure success. That's just the business model um, that, that informs their decision making. Our model is we're selling a brand. And what we're trying to do every day is elevate that brand. And we believe that if we elevate that brand and we create more addicts, across a wide range of demo demographics, we're going to serve our brand, we're going to grow our business, we're going to build our model all over the world, which is exactly what we're doing. That's a very different raison d'etre than trying to get the largest number of people in a certain demo to watch a particular show. Um, I'm coming from a lunch with the great Steven Soderbergh, who uh, is doing a show for us. It's actually going to be on Cinemax called The Nick, st starring, starring Clive Owen. And Stephen, who's a great artist and who did Behind the Candelabra for us, said, look, the liberation I feel working at HBO with excellence as my metric, that is an extraordinary thing. It's extraordinary for the actors, the producers, everybody involved in the, in the project. And whether you're talking, quite frankly, to David Benioff and Dan Weiss, whether you're talking to Armando Iannucci, who does Veep, what, whoever you're talking to in our family, that is a very liberating creative dynamic. And that's, I think, our blessing. And you're attracting people who've been at this a long time who exactly. see something new. So you mentioned Candelabra. Michael Douglas comes to mind as yeah. a guy who's seen it all in this he's business and said he's yeah. never seen anything like his yeah, experience yeah, you know, there. M Michael's line to me was, I've been doing this for 40 years. What's in the water here? And everybody who I encounter at your company, the marketing team, the PR team, the business team, and I think that's because all we're trying to do is create the best product that we can. That's a very liberating dynamic inside the company. And so we don't wake up the morning after a show premieres and say, what's the number? We wake up the morning after a show premieres and say, did it deliver on our expectation of excellence? We actually know that before it premiered. I said to Barry Levinson after he did um, Kravorkian for us, or before it had been on the air, congratulations. And he said to me, well, why, why are you, congrats? you don't know how this is going to do. I said, yeah, but I know it's brilliant. I've seen it. That's all I need to know. And he said, look, I've, I've been at this a long time. That's, you're the first CEO of a network or a studio who's ever said anything like that. That's not because I'm more noble or because HBO is more noble. It's because that literally is what defines success for our brand and for our company. And I m must say, globally as well. I was in Singapore two weeks ago, I was in France last week. Everywhere we go, our brand is traveling. And what's fascinating is that the media in each country is as sophisticated about what we're trying to do as they are here. 
and the, the questions and the level of sophistication of the questions about our artists, uh, about the producers, about what we're trying to do, it, it, it's as if they're, you know, they live in Los Angeles or New York and they are every bit as expert uh, on what the brand stands for. So the case in your point about it not being about the numbers is girls. Yeah. Um, girls, if you would read magazines or look around the culture. Mike. I'll speak loudly until we figure that out. Um, here's another one. There we go. Good hustle. Thank you. Um, <laughs> a case in Richard's point about it not being the numbers is, is girls. Um, I don't know exactly what it is. Average is something like a million viewers. No, no, no. Viewers. no. The cum's up to about well, five. The cum's up to five. Yeah. But in a single night, it would be a million, and then the cum is, is five. That's yeah. not a huge number. If we're thinking about network terms, That's but that show is critical to your success. Absolutely. It, it, like Veep, Right? Like Silicon Valley, they are high quality shows reaching a particular part. So I look at it this way. We have 43 million constituents right, across HBO and Cinemax. We're trying to create more and more addicts among those constituents, and we're trying to build a new generation of viewers. For some people, Silicon Valley, to them, is the reason they subscribe to HBO. For some people, it's Veep. For some people, it's Game of Thrones. For some people, it's girls. Some people are watching boxing. Some people are watching our movies or, or our documentaries. It doesn't matter to us if a subscriber feels an emotional connection, a kind of passion engagement with our brand. That's what we're striving for. And as long as, it's, it's Soderbergh said to me today at lunch, he said, look, you guys stand for good shit. That's what, that's what HBO is all about. You do good shit. And I think that what we're trying to do and what artists understand we're trying to do, and this is the key, because we are only as good as the people who come to work for us. And my job, the job of my colleagues in New York and Los Angeles, Mike Lombardo, who runs programming, become a magnet for the best talent to want to work. And there is a surfeit of competition. There's a lot of people doing great work. I say over and over again, this is not a zero-sum game. It's fine for other people to do good work. As long as we are playing our game to our full capacity, which is what we think about every day, we are going to have more than our fair share of attention and acclaim. So that's the focus. That's the North Star. And what you want is Lena Dunham feeling that there's not a better place to work because she's talking to her friends in the creative community, and she's saying, this is, this is an extraordinary experience, as is Steven, as are David Benioff and Dan Weiss, and it becomes catalytic. If nothing else today, we walk out with a new slogan for HBO, that's we right. do good shit. <laughs> exactly. I think that's, that, exactly. That's that Steven's works, saying. Rolls off the tongue. So Lena Dunham walks into your office one day. I don't think a lot of people in the country knew who Lena Dunham was before Girls. Yeah. And I ask this because I think it goes to what you're known for, which is having good instincts and then trusting the instinct and saying, I like you, go make a show for me. Right. Walk us through the process. So she the, sits the, down, the, then the, what well, happens? Well, actually, it, 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 it precedes me. What, what really happened, and this speaks to our culture, I think, is that a young executive in Los Angeles named Kat McCaffrey was at South by Southwest, she saw Tiny Furniture, which was Lena's first movie, which I believe she made for $37,000, if I have this right. And Kat took the DVD of Tiny Furniture, brought it back to the team. Lena uh, uh, parallel processed in writing what became the pilot uh, of Girls. We all watched Tiny Furniture. And what we say over and over again is nobody knows that Girls is going to be Girls. You do know that that's an original voice you do know that that is a differentiated voice which defines our brand at its best. So it really was cat into LA, all of us looking at it and feeling, quite frankly, very, very comfortable that this was something special. That it breaks into the zeitgeist like it does, nobody knows that that's gonna happen. Nobody knows, you know, what we knew about True Detective, which we're obviously very, very proud of, is that it was excellent. That it did 12 and a half million viewers, that you can't predict. So. You know, Grant Tinker used to have a, a the celebrated um, uh, executive at NBC back in the 80s and 90s, and he had a wonderful phrase. He said, look, we're looking for the two Ps, right? We're looking to be proud and popular. The truth of the matter is, since you don't know whether or not you're going to be popular, whether or not the show will break through, we didn't even know that about Thrones. All 
your North Star has to be, are you proud of it? And if collectively we're proud of the product, of the scripts, uh, uh, we feel a shared vision with the people we're working for, we're very comfortable with that. And more and more, if you stick to that, you're going to find that you have uh, your fair share of things that break through. Well, obviously, you were smart to trust your gut on True Detective, but that's, again, it's a kind of another Lena Dunham story. This is a guy who had written a couple novels, yep. not particularly well-known novels, right. um, and then writes up this show. I don't think a lot of TV executives would maybe have taken the meeting, A, and B, Green well, the show. Well, I'll tell you something. Know. When when Mike and uh, Sue Nagel at the time uh, and myself read, I think it was 420 pages, you knew that this was a remarkable piece of work. And to have Matthew and Woody attached to it, Kerry Fukuyama directing, everybody felt pretty comfortable that this was consonant with our brand. What you don't know is that it is going to become such a you know, huge part of the cultural conversation. That you just can't predict. I'll be honest with you. If you had said to me that was going to do 12 and a half million viewers, I, I would have said to you, um, highly, highly unlikely. It's, it's, it's very, um, it's complex. It's a bit dark. You have to stay with it. You have to pay attention. People loved it. People loved it. And in a broad audience, not in a niche way. That was a huge audience. A huge audience. Speaking of which, Game of Thrones has been a cultural explosion. Yep. Um, what has that meant in terms of your brand? Um, you, you, it's nice to have the 17 million, right? Have that show to 18. go with. 18. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Never get your numbers wrong with Richard Pleffler. 18, you know that. 18. But you need, do you need a massive hit like no, that? No, no. You, I mean, listen, it's wonderful to have something that is both of very high quality, um, very much on brand, and that breaks through, becomes a global phenomenon, has huge uh, back-end home video uh, attached to it, is as much, you know, the, you know, the, <laughs> the uh, uh, other side of the coin is the most pirated show uh, on television. But I, I always say in response to that, that's the bad news story. The good news story is eight, 18 million people in the United States are watching it legally. But that's all David Benioff and Dan Weiss and George R. R. Martin. You know, that is Mike and I believing in David and Dan, listening to their vision, seeing their passion. Um, David uh, and Dan really are uh, quintessential auteurs. And um, they love the product. They know it in their bones. They breathe it. And um, I think for George, you know, whose whole life is built around the books, to have entrusted them uh, with the legacy of the series speaks volumes uh, about just how special they are. I was interested to read that at HBO, and keep me honest on the number here, 78% yeah, 80%. Or 80 of your viewership is for theatrical films. It's not for the shows yeah, we're seven, talking about. 80% of viewing is still theatrical films. So what does that mean uh, for your business? It, well, it's, it means you got to have the movies if you're going to run as successful a premium television network as we run because, well, the original programming takes a disproportionate share of the halo as it should because it's the original work of our network, the truth of the matter is that the consumer still loves to watch Hollywood movies for a second, a third, and a fourth time. And they are in the tens of millions of viewers. So you put Fast and Furious on, you're going to have 21 million viewers of Fast and Furious over the course uh, of that run. So it's very, very important to make sure that your theatrical movie lineup is there. The halo on our brand the driving dynamic, uh, what gives us our pricing power, I think, um, is the combination of that theatrical superiority with the cultural cachet uh, of our original program. You need both. You guys obviously are ahead of the game on so many things, but as you know, this business moves so quickly. Yes, it does. What do you do, Richard, to make sure you're not caught flat-footed and celebrating your relevance today? Yeah. Well, we spend about 10 seconds celebrating today. Um, we, we, we wake up, uh, I, I have a little sheet of paper I keep in here. I will not, I call this, it, it, to be polite, 
what can get screwed up today list, um, wh which I keep very close. Such an optimist. Which I keep, well, it's, it's, you gotta be, you gotta be very vigilant all the time because you're right, the velocity of change is extraordinary. Look, our digital evolution is a big part um, of our thinking. Uh, HBO Go uh, is a remarkable product. It will evolve and get better and better. And what I say all the time is we will not be caught without the ability to pivot, both with our partners, because I think, um, you know, whether it's the cable partner, a telco partner, a satellite partner, we want to grow with them. We think there's a lot of growth left still in this business. And having an exciting digital product where you can watch HBO uh, on, your, on your PlayStation, on your Xbox, uh, on your Kindle, um, on your iPad, that's very, very important, particularly for a generation of young people who will more and more, as you well know, uh, are getting their video uh, in another place um, from, the from the TV. And so you feel yourself competing directly with, say, Netflix? No, we feel ourselves uh, wanting to always evolve our own brand. And what we think about is, since more and more people want the option of watching HBO on different platforms, we want to make sure they have that. That's what HBO Go is all about. Globally, as we improve and expand on this IP platform, if you think about a billion tablets and smartphones around the world, and you imagine the optionality uh, globally, where we have you know, 85 million international subscribers and growing, that's a, that's a very exciting dynamic. So we're going we're gonna to make sure we continue to advance the, global, the uh, digital possibilities of the brand. We're going to continue to make sure that we create as many options as possible for our customer. And uh, it's all at the end of the day about the product. So yes, you want people to have the convenience of watching it on their iPad or PlayStation, but they ain't coming there if there isn't a magnet to get them there. So first and foremost on the North Star, make the content outstanding. Secondly, build as much dexterity as you can so that people can watch when they want, how they want, where they want. All right, we've got less than a minute on our little shot clock down here. The light became yellow, it's very I disturbing. We're on that. our way to red. So that. give us uh, a little hint, what's ahead for HBO? We have, uh, well, wonderful piece by the Entourage guys called Ballers, which stars The Rock, which is about aging football players uh, at a certain period of their life set in Miami, I think will be uh, a, a huge popular hit. It's actually quite poignant about kind of the end of people's careers and how they evolve. We have a show called The Brink, um, starring Tim Robbins as Secretary of State, Jack Black as a Foreign Service Officer. I liken it to kind of mash in Southwest Asia, um, a satire and parody of America's hubris um, in getting involved in different parts of the world. Leftovers, created by Damon Lindelof, uh, who, who brought us Lost, um, a kind of metaphysical, uh, you've seen the trailer if you've been watching the network, I think it, it will be a breakthrough show. Westworld, um, which J.J. Abrams is producing uh, based on the movie, and This May Coming, The Normal Heart, uh, based on Larry Kramer's award-winning play, uh, directed by Ryan Murphy, starring Julia Roberts and, and Mark Ruffalo. So we have a surfeit of uh, new things on their way. And again, um, the blessing for us is the line at the door uh, of talent, of artists who want to be part of the network. And um, you know, our job is to keep them coming in and make sure that we continue to create an environment where they can do their best work.